Hey, hey, it's Stefan Angelini from The Investor Types. Thanks for tuning in to another episode. We're going to talk about investing into regional properties. And we're talking with Kate Bakos, who's got over 10 years experience in buying properties, both regional and metro. And over the last few years, she's bought hundreds and hundreds in the regional area. Because she's got experience investing in metro as well, we're going to deep dive into well, what's, what's better for certain people, regional or metro? What are the cases for each? What's good for capital growth? What's good for income? She's going to give us some really good tips when you are searching for your investment property. What are some of the things you need to look out for? It's an amazing conversation. She's a very smart woman. But before we do get into it, let me remind you that anything in this video, podcast, it's just general information only. Please don't consider it as personal advice. And if you're looking for personal advice, please reach out to your own financial professional to get some personal financial advice. In saying that, it's a really interesting episode. Let's get into it. G'day, everyone. Uh, Thanks for joining us for another episode of Investor Types. Luckily enough, today we're talking about investing into regional properties and we're talking with Kate Bakos. Kate, how you going? Thanks for coming on board. I'm good, living the dream, working from home, having a great time. <laughs> it's a crazy time. It's a crazy it time. It is. Uh, chatting, chatting to Kate, um, we both grew up, uh, I grew up in the western suburbs of Melbourne, uh, got out of there. Kate lives in Yarraville, one of the trendiest spots in the western suburbs of Melbourne, um, the up and coming area of the last few years. Um, and what I like to say is, Kate, we call Kate the queen of property here in Melbourne. And I think probably the most articulate person in the Western suburbs, I'm going to say. Oh, that's <laughs> so not fair. <laughs> you, asked if you, you asked if you could hang something on me. That's so mean. <laughs> You'll be back like a boomerang. I'm putting money on it. <laughs> yeah, I think I actually will be. <laughs> oh, I've been talking to that many people about, you know, where do you want to live? Yarraville, Seddon, Footscray, all these places that have just changed oh, so much over West the last 10 best. years. West is the place to be. Yeah, it is. I'm um, looking at over here. It's great. And look, people still see West as going over the Westgate Bridge. I, I've, I've got some friends that have never been over the Westgate Bridge in their life. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> and here we are. We're going to talk about investing into regional properties. They're going further than the Westgate Bridge for an investment Much property. Yeah. So, Kate, when we talk about investing into regional property, it's going to be really interesting just to talk about your past, probably specifically over the last ten years. So, tell us a bit about your experience yeah. in buying property in the last ten years. Yeah, for the last 10 years, that is what I've been doing. Um, I've been a buyer's agent for, for just over 10 years and it's, it's a perfect role for me. I was looking for a long time for, you know, the, a blend of things that would be, be perfect for you know, what I think I bring to the table and I've invested myself um, many years ago I started and I've worked as a mortgage broker. I've worked in the industry in a sales office and... And having my own investments, I thought was a really good combination. So I, I started my career, yep, just over 10 years ago. And I've gone out on my own since 2014. Mm-hmm. And my activity is, main, my main focus is investment. And I love the, the theory, the strategy, the talking people through, you know, where they should start and, and what sort of strategy is right for them. But I also obviously help a lot of home finders too. And that takes a different um, skill set and a different focus because it's an emotional process and you're, you're there sometimes to counsel them, sometimes to tell them, no, we're not doing this. This is not in the plan. Um, yeah, I, I've got good at telling people what they don't want to hear, but that, that role is a, a very protective role where you do have to be completely honest with people. Yep, hundred percent. And so when we talk about experiencing buying property, what areas have mm. you been sort of looking into and diving deep into over the last 10 years? Great question. So um, I came over to the West uh, eight years ago now and it was because I had really fallen in love with what it had to offer and I was feeling pangs of jealousy when I was buying property over here for clients. I actually came from the southeast, so I'd always lived around Mentone Mordialic and I worked uh, in a real estate office in Sandringham. So my familiarity was with you know, the other side of the bridge. So when I started, I was doing a lot of work in in Bayside and Kingston, um, Glen Ira, Warrandara, Stonington, and, you know, that that was great. But I had to get to know all of the city because we are market generalists. We have to be familiar with everywhere. And I was working for a firm in North Melbourne. So, of course, I was exposed to the north as well. And a lot of guys in the office uh, lived 
in the north. So I, I got my familiarity up and then spread it west. So um, now it's fair to say that probably 75% of my work is in the inner north, inner west and the regions and then the other 25% is, is where I originally started and came from. Okay. So when we look at the regions, so areas like Geelong, Ballarat, um, these places yeah. have been skyrocketing over the last few years and been drawing a lot of investors in. And when people think of regional areas, they think of, well, there's more land space, there's cheaper properties, probably more restricted yeah. capital growth. <laughs> um, tell me a bit about your experience when searching for investment properties for people out in the regions. Yeah. When I first uh, decided that I needed to have an offering that delivered a stronger rental return. That was my motivation mm. for going into the regions, not just to have a lower price point, um, but, but, but to be able to say to someone, yes, we'll, we'll get 5% gross rental return because that's not something that you'll commonly find in a good part of a metro city or particularly in our city here in Melbourne. So I was able to get up to 6.5% gross rental yield in Ballarat 10 years ago. Mm. And that was, you know, a factor of lower price points than what you're seeing now and a tighter vacancy rate and, you know, less housing. Since then, Ballarat's had an explosion of um, housing subdivision, particularly towards the western side of town. And we've seen plenty of investors jump onto Ballarat. And I'd say the last five years has seen the strongest influx because we had, as you well know, um, limitation to credit availability for, for investors, particularly from about 2016. Mm -hmm. APRA... Um, made it really hard for the banks and the banks made it really hard for borrowers. So we saw a clamp down on investment lending, servicing was tighter, interest rates were different, um, P&I was the, the common offering as opposed to interest only. So investors just said it's all too hard to get our hands on decent sums of cash, let's go for a, a more demure budget. And mm -hmm. I had a lot of people asking me then about the regions because if someone has it in their mind that they want a house on a full block of land, and a lot of people have that, um, you know, that assumption that that's the way to go, I can blast that myth another day. But if that's what they want and they've got $300,000, well, Ballarat certainly five years ago was a city that could offer that. So the, the regions have had some really amazing growth of late for a combination of reasons, but that was one driver to... Um, places like Ballarat, Bendigo, Geelong, Castlemaine, really finding themselves on the map. Now, talking about buying properties out there, now you've bought over 200 in both Ballarat, over 200 in Geelong, so you've got a lot of experience yeah. out there. Do you see yeah. there's much difference in the sales and, and even auction process between either buying a, pro a place in Melbourne Metro as a, as a buying place to the regional towns? Mm, yeah, there is. <laughs> it's yeah. huge. Um, when I first went to Ballarat, I got to know the area initially, so weekends up there interviewing targeted people. I wanted to feel like a, you know, a bit of a local area expert before I started um, placing clients there. So I got to know a lot of people. Um, what, I'm, what I really uh, underestimated was just how gentle real estate transactions are there and the amount of trust in that you know, country style um, way of doing business is really beautiful and it's still alive and well, despite the fact mm -hmm. that they're dealing with Melburnians every weekend. Yep. Um, I find now if, if I'm negotiating on a property in Ballarat, they, chances are there's not a contract available yet. Yep. So it's really just an academic conversation about agreeing on a price subject to, you know, a contract coming through that has no nasty surprises. Mm -hmm. And the agents will shake your hand or ring you up and say congratulations and literally tell people the property sold and put a sold stick on the board without a contract being executed. And, you know, it really is a town where I say the handshake is firmer. Yeah. We've, we've got some awesome agents here in, in the city in Melbourne, but in, in the country, that handshake is their promise. And it's, yep. you know, I used to really bust their chops asking them, well, how will you deal with other buyers? And what will you tell them? And what about if someone offers more? And they'd say, Kate, the property is sold to you. It's yep. all good. It's your client. We've done the deal. And then, well, what if, what if the vendor gets a better offer? No, the vendor, he's a man of his word. The, yeah. the deal is done. So it's very, very rare. Well, I've certainly, from my experiences, found it very rare that I'll get any nasty surprises out of a negotiation in Ballarat. They, they really do still have that lovely, friendly country element. Um, Geelong's that, a bit treat, different. If you treat them with respect, you'll get respect back? Oh, always. Yeah. Just beautiful people. You know, yeah. I can... Um, 
go up to Ballarat to see some properties and they'll have my favourite coffee waiting for me. I've known these people for a long time. And, you know, they, there's a lot of agents in Ballarat, so yep. competition between them is pretty tough and you've got yeah. to, you know, understand your own niche as an agent and, and, and they're very hardworking. You know, mm -hmm. they'll um, be working around the clock like a lot of agents do, but it's, uh, it's a very, very different market because they're, their auctions are, are less prevalent in Ballarat. You might have an auction campaign for a high price property, but your your lower priced and medium priced properties, you tend not to find auction campaigns of the norm. They'll have a private sale. Yep. And again, when you look at the quoted range, chances are if you make an offer within it, it's enough to buy it. Uh, there's you know that underquoting regime is not the same mm -hmm. in Ballarat. And as a result, if if they do have an auction there you'll find that locals aren't quite as comfortable with it either i remember going to one auction in soldiers hill which is like the fitzroy of of ballarat and i had tried to buy this property prior and the agent wouldn't sell it to me because he wanted to have his auction and that was cool but i i thought fine whatever i've got to go so on this miserable wet rainy saturday i drove up to the auction and did my normal thing, you know, you get your gladiator pose and your dark glasses, even though there's clouds in the sky and just write the first bid and walk up to bidders and, you know, all your intimidation tactics and everyone just froze and like the agent's calling for a bid and <laughs> anyway, it passed into me and he said, what were you doing? I was just, you know, bidding. That's <laughs> what it, I do. There was no <laughs> additional tricks or anything. It's just, that's, that's not what it's like in the country. So yeah, I used um, a sledgehammer to crack a walnut. <laughs> Realised okay. after that, it's, yeah, well, next time I say I want to buy it prior, <laughs> they so, might think about that option. <laughs> yeah. Tell me about how, how is Geelong different? Geelong is a lot more Melbourne-centric. Yeah. So Geelong has had phenomenal growth. Its median house price is higher. It's closer to Melbourne geographically. And a lot of the agents, the dominant agents and the you know managers and principals of agencies have worked in Melbourne. Some of them have done their, you know, the majority of their real estate, you know, training and kicked off their career in Melbourne. Mm. So there's definitely that, that Melbourne training regime under their belt. And, you know, Geelong is, is a, our second city and it's a very industrial city. Mm -hmm. um, but the demand has been so high and the price points in the, the inner suburbs within Geelong mm -hmm. have property price tags. A million dollars is not an unusual thing for one yeah. of the, the inner um, suburbs That's in Geelong, so of course, yeah, Newtown, new West, South yep. Geelong, East Geelong. Um, I love Drum and Rippleside. I'm on the record of <laughs> saying I love, and Belmont by the River. You know, there's some really beautiful parts of of Geelong that are very aspirational for a lot of Melbournians, and you yep. get that. Um, there's a higher proportion of um, of owner occupiers to investors as opposed to Ballarat, you'll get a lot more investors in Ballarat as a percentage. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, these agents know that they're working on a motion, they're dealing with a lot of tree changers and sea changers who are moving their lives to Geelong, getting their kids into the private schools and facing the commute or setting up a home office or business from Geelong. So they've got the opportunity to get a great price and to have a fantastic show when they have an auction. So you, you do tend to find that you don't get that, that same opportunity to, to just make an offer and buy something. Sometimes you do have to sit out the four-week campaign and just rock up at auction with everyone else. Yeah. Um, so looking, looking at Ballarat and Geelong, I'm going to call them regional properties, even though they're now big cities. They're, they're such big yeah. cities and so many people live yeah, there. Yeah, they are. Let's look at the cases compared to buying a regional property, whether it be Ballarat, Geelong, or even somewhere further out, say a stall or anywhere regional versus mm. buying a property in a metro area, you know, within a 25, 30, 35, 40 kilometre radius of the CBD. What's yep. the differences between the regional and the metro? That's an awesome question. Now, a lot of people look at the regional performance that we've all been enjoying of late and they think that they can bank that. It's a bonus. Um, mm. I've always been on the record as saying the regions have their own special offering and there are a lot of reasons why an investor could go into a region. But for outperformance capital growth, that shouldn't be their reason. Mm. There's no earthly um, way of saying that a regional area will deliver a stronger capital growth rate than a metro. In yep. fact, I mean, I, there, are, there are certainly case in points and I, I've seen some amazing work by a colleague of mine who, who has explained the virtues of the regions beautifully. But 
if I'm looking at Geelong and Ballarat compared to Melbourne or even some of our, our smaller regions, as you mentioned, Stall, or if you're looking at you know, Warrnambool, or, there, there are a lot of them. The, the reality is that long-term capital growth for a house on its own full block, you'll get better performance in, in, in Melbourne. So why and have these the regional, regional properties, what's, what's been happening over the last few years? Why have they just gone skyrocketed in price? Yeah, they've been a little bit more resilient to our downturns and because of their lower price points, they're seen mm. as a lesser risk. So mm. during the, um, the, the post um, APRA intervention when investment lending ground for halt, people could still get their money on a little, uh, their hands on a little bit of money. So they were yep. prepared to go into the regions. We've also seen some really strong incentives for owner occupiers and we've seen a uh, a bit of an adoption of tree change with various things like government incentives. We had good move in Victoria, if anyone remembers those ads. There are still incentives for, for buying new and, and building in the, in the country. Yep. And also we've got employers offering incentives. So we've got a lot of decentralised services such as Consumer Affairs Victoria. They've got a, an office setting up in Ballarat and they've assisted people who are willing to live in Ballarat, they've assisted them financially to do the move. And we saw the likes of TAC doing that in Geelong. So plenty of employers have also um, made it worth their employees' while to consider life in the regions. And so combine that with, you know, improved rail amenity and the improved um, tech and accessibility to being able to, you know, talk to your colleagues at work and run meetings, but from home. Yep. Um, and now, obviously, coronavirus has, has really um, intensified that. We've proven to ourselves that we can work from home. And a lot of people are saying, well, my kids could have a bigger backyard. We could have, you know, more space. We could be in a community with a sense of belonging. Let's, let's consider it. So aside from just investors with smaller budgets who have continued to stay active and work on their portfolio, we've seen an adoption of moving away from the city. And the numbers are showing that. The, the rail part of it, it's, it's amazing how quickly you can get from places like Ballarat and Geelong to the CBD now. In fact, it, mm. if you're coming from the eastern suburbs and you're coming from 10, 15 kilometres away, it's going to take you longer to get from there into the city than it'll take you to get from Geelong or Ballarat into the CBD. It's crazy. It's a really good point. I can be in Geelong on the train and work sitting in a comfy V-Lion chair, working away writing a blog or something, and... I used to live in Mount Eliza, so I remember the Frankston to Parliament Station mm. ride. Stopping all stations? No way. Geelong's way quicker. In <laughs> fact, the Frankston ride compares with Ballarat, and I'm not joking. Yeah, and you're right. with the capital growth side of things, look, people are saying, look, I can live in regional, and you know, I'm happy to live in regional with my family. But then you've got, I guess, people like myself who want to live close to the CBD, who own a business near the CBD, and you know, yeah. love that inner, the inner ring side of things. And that's where, you know, we eventually want to end up. And I think that's still a lot of people who do want to venture in closer. So I totally agree with you. As much as I love the regions and I go to Ballarat and get really excited still, even after all these years, I'll still go there for the weekend when I'm allowed. Um, <laughs> I, I think that this, you know, tree change, sea change adoption, there are some people whose lives will be, beautifully enhanced forever because of the ability to do that. But there are plenty of people who, it, it sounds good right now because we're locked in little apartments and we're bumping into each other while we're trying to do work. Um, and so it feels like a good idea, but once Corona is behind us, you know, for some, this will have been a fad, the fantasy of moving away from the city because our city is still an amazing place. And, you know, there's a lot of employers and employment opportunities in the city, but there's also a lot of um, ability to, you know, to be with the people that you love and to, from a, a public transport point of view, we've got a, a pretty accessible city and we've got a lot of um, money going into public transport infrastructure. We all know that that middle ring um, rail link has dredged up our city and made parking and commuting a nightmare for now. But when the yeah. Metro link's done, it will be awesome. So th yeah. there is a lot to, um, to remember before we cast aside the city um, <laughs> and run away to the country. Yeah, you're right. Even, even me, I've got family all over the place. So trying to be central to all of that so that, you know, my child can go and see everyone is, is what's paramount to me. But let's get back on the, on the investor side of things. And you really harped on, yeah. you know, the, the rental 
if you're going to invest in regional and you know inner city suburbs, you're looking anywhere between two and three percent as a rental yield. Sub um, yeah. regional, you're looking at what four to six, depending on it's where you dropped are. Dropped a little bit now. Yeah, we've gone to the days of getting six percent in Ballarat, unless you're going into a really awful socioeconomic area that will give you a lot of tenant headaches. Yep. Um, you can still get six percent in a couple of places, but. I say this on the record, there are property managers that won't look after that suburb. So investors mm. need to think twice before they think that rental yield is the be all and end all because high rental yield can go hand in hand with headache factor. 100%. Um, the cash but, flow side of things is if you're going to buy a property yeah. that sounds too good to be true, too much money coming in. It probably is. <laughs> going to be headaches. There's going to be headaches. Yeah. Um, but how important is cash flow? So if there's an investor out there that, that wants to put money into an investment property but can't afford to lose money on the property, I yes. guess that's the cash flow factor. That's the look at the rental yield. Um, but still, you've got to make yeah, sure you've got a good flow, property. Exactly. So cash flow is important. I think it's the most important factor. Um, but anyone who's searching for capital growth won't care about cash flow until they don't have it. Yeah. Having cash flow and buffer and a little bit of breathing space can make the difference between a fire sale and riding out the storm and holding properties. Mm -hmm. And in tandem with capital growth properties, you can really buffer your, your cash flows as an investor. And you, you're dealing with a different segment of the market, different tenant experience. Um, and often your capital growth cycles aren't necessarily in sync. So buffering is a really good concept. But for anyone who is looking at investing and cash flow is paramount, for them, it might be um, that they've got a, a loan that requires them to, to receive a certain amount of income and the bank wants to see that appraisal letter. Well, if, if the appraisal letter is calling for 4%, they know that they're either going for a souped up little apartment with lots of bells and whistles that probably won't deliver great capital growth anyway, yep. or they're going into a region and getting a house that is rent ready and in a nice location that will definitely deliver 4%. And I could easily spend 400,000 and get 4% 4, 4 plus some in, in Ballarat and then in parts of Geelong as well. So if the cash is a rental income is critical to getting the loan, or if that investor has modeled out how much income they need to sustain their portfolio and to continue purchasing as well then they will need to pepper their portfolio with some, some better yielding properties. Mm. And I, I always say to people, if your end goal is a certain amount of um, rental income into retirement and you've modelled out that you might need, let's say, five, six, seven properties, well, every time you consider an acquisition, you need to ask yourself, can you demonstrate to the bank that you can afford the subsequent one? Mm -hmm. So you don't just look at your borrowing capacity for for property 2020, you're also looking at what happens when you buy 2020, how much capacity have you got for 2021? And that is how I continue to springboard as an investor into more property. Because if I maxed out my borrowing capacity on my 2020 purchase, I can't do anything in 2021. And it's all well and good to, to say, well, at least I've got a capital growth asset. But if you've stopped at just one or just two, when you could have expanded your portfolio with a better um, blend of yielding and capital growth properties, well, then the person that thought it through and had the blend is likely to get to their end goal um, when the person that just maxed their capacity is sitting on, on one property that they've popped you know, all of the eggs into that one basket. Yeah, you're preaching. You're preaching. I love it. I love it. It's, it comes down to individual circumstances. Have your goals and your plan and understand where you want to get to and don't just yeah. invest into a property because you want to. You think it's the right one. Make sure it's part yeah. of your structured plan. You understand where you're going. I recently chatted to a 63-year-old totally. who's got a few cash flow properties um, and wanted to sell one to go into a capital growth property. And I go, but you're going to retire soon and it's not going to assist you yeah. in, in earning that income you need for your retirement. So you've got to rejig the portfolio. Okay. Stephen, that's a really good point. You, you've mentioned cash flow. Sometimes the, region, the reason for a region isn't just cash flow. There's two reasons typically. The other one is time or lack of. So as you've just said, you dealt with someone in their 60s. If I've got someone who has limited numbers of years left in their career, I don't want to be the advocate that buys them something that keeps them on that treadmill for 10 years longer than they want to be. Yes. So if you're looking at your property and it's buy and hold strategy and you want to think that by the time you retire, you might not have... Uh, 
got rid of all of the debt, but your property has tipped over to cash flow positive. So it's no longer requiring you to stay on that treadmill. That's, that's a well thought out plan. And often I'll have someone who might be um, earning a really good income, but if they're only earning it for another couple of years and they want to stop, I want to be the person that supports their retirement plan, not that tips it on its head. Yeah, that's right. Keep working until you're 80. Let's not have that. But let's look at the people that are looking to purchase an investment property, specifically in the regions. What tips would you, if you could just give out three to five tips, what would be the main tips you would say to someone, if you want to buy a property in the regions, this is the top things you should look at. Yeah. First thing is understand your own cash flow and how much you can spend. Because if you can go bigger and bolder, have a second think about the region. You might be more suited to Metro. So the mm -hmm. first thing is to get good financial advice. The second thing is to not rely on your own emotion. So if you've got an affinity with something because you love horses or whatever, it has to have genuine and proven growth drivers. Mm -hmm. And typically it needs to have a little bit of a stronger um, population, exhibiting a little bit of population growth too. You don't want a town mm -hmm. that's shrinking. But when I say population, ideally you want to have a hospital, a university. If it's a, if it's a robust town like that, you can be assured of a lot of um, initiatives and incentives and, and just money being spent to continue attracting people and creating jobs. When you haven't got job creation, you haven't got a, a robust set of growth drivers because if the town has limited jobs, then there's no incentive for people to want to come to the town and therefore you'll get limited capital growth. Mm -hmm. um, the next one is understand your pockets within the region. Don't assume that Ballarat's all the same. It's so not. There's over 26 suburbs. There were 26 last time I counted, but there's little new ones being created every time they do a subdivision. And every single suburb, every little pocket of streets, they all have their own flavour. They have their own crime rates. They have their own sets of growth drivers. And the best way that you can... Um, glean a bit of information about the town is spend some time there stay up there do a week away do a weekend away chat to property managers I reckon they are the most underrated amazing source of information about an area when you're commencing your reconnaissance because if you say to a property manager I will be your client when I buy what would you love me to buy that makes your job better and makes my result happier they will tell you exactly what to avoid and they'll tell you what the locals like and they'll tell you what the locals will pay extra rental money for. And believe me, it will be a surprise because I used to think walkability and access to the train and all of that stuff was what people wanted because that's what we want in, in Melbourne. We want to be near the cafes. We want mm -hmm. short walk scores. In Ballarat, they want to be really warm and they want their yards to be fenced and gated and secure. They love having pets and they love powered sheds. Now, that's a generalisation, but if I didn't learn that, I wouldn't have been able to pick out properties that keep local tenants, you know, 10 years along, they keep them in place for a long time and they keep them happily paying the rent. It's just a, a set of questions that you've got to ask and the property manager is a great start. So how important is land size then, especially when you're looking out in the regions? Everyone wants land. Oh, land value. And the rate of value growth is the right question to ask. Okay. Uh, you can go and buy 2,000 square metres of land, but if it's um, growing at a, a lesser rate than the 500 square metre block closer into town and you're getting the same rent, well, what are you doing? If your motivation is to subdivide, different story, but then that's a different set of questions altogether. And I often say to people, why, why are you looking at subdividing? You know, if, if you're bored and it's to be busy or to have a good story to barbecue, just find a, a hobby that you like yeah. because there's a, a lot of risk in, in subdivision when you don't know what you're doing and there's a lot more risk when you're very, very busy and your asset is two hours drive away and you haven't got those tentacles into the local market to know who to ask to, you know, help you with your project. So when, when, when it comes to land size, I say go for land value and its yeah. rate of increase. Well, on that, on that developing front of things, um, I, I do hear a lot of people come to me and say, look, I want to get into the development game. I'm going to buy a property out yeah. in the suburbs. I'm going to subdivide it. I'm going to put a house on the side. Um, and I go, oh, wow, have you done your numbers? Because a lot of the times you see construction costs and the amount of time it's going to take to do this outweigh mm. the benefits in the short term. However, in the long term, you could, be some, you could see some benefits. Yes, um, that opens a conversation to the concept of what we call land banking, where mm. you can sit on something that's subdividable, but you're not necessarily 
trying to, you know, initiate any kind of gain or, or start the project at the onset. And clever builders and developers do this. In fact, they get into a cycle where they, they buy a, a property, they'll call it a site, but it will have a house on it that's reasonable enough to attract a, an, to attract a tenant that will pay the rent and not whinge about too many things and give them their opportunity if it's a, a privately held um, acquisition and they can claim some um, you know, negative gearing benefits on it as well. So if your long-term goal is to pick a good area that will grow in value and by the time you get your hands on it, carve it up, put your townhouses there, you can create a nice pro um, product and you can sell with a, a better um, profit margin. That's the aim of the game. If you're buying something and you're working on slim margins and you're popping something really cheap and cheerful there and cutting the guts out of, you know, the the, the type of style internally and some of the appliances and finishes, you're appealing to a market that's not looking at it with an aspirational filter. They're looking at it with an affordable filter. Yep. So your profits are less and then your, your risk of um, losing money in already a skinny profit is high because it's the first time you're doing this. You could have project overruns, tradies that delay things, bad weather. You could have mishaps at council. There could be issues with all connections. The list goes on. So for anyone that's looking at getting you know, dunking a toe in the water and getting into development with the idea of doing it long term, the regions can be a good place to start because you're working with smaller numbers and you've got, you know, less risk. But if you're looking at making money and targeting the regions, I'd, I'd say think very carefully and have a really good understanding of the end value of what you're trying to create and who it will appeal to, who's your target market. Because if you're looking at first home buyer market and you're working off slim margins, I'd say it could be a massive waste of time and a big headache. <laughs> so clever. Um, I love what you said there. You've really done your deep dive. But you obviously had this conversation a lot of times. Um, so have yeah. I. Do your numbers, oh, you, know your use numbers. Use this now. So watch this video. Hundred <laughs> <laughs> percent. Look, Kate. Um, look, you've already you've obviously told us what kind of investor typically goes into re into regional areas. But let's just give me, give me a summary. If the if you've got a client come to you, and yeah. you, you see their certain, what does their situation look like? That where that they would go into a regional investment property. Uh, chances are, if they're an investor, they've got tight cash flows mm -hmm. or they've got a, a tighter budget and they're really um, deliberately wanting to go for a house on a full block of land. Yep. And if, if that's their motivation and, and it means a lot to them, I, I have a saying, you know, I, want, I don't expect my investors to love what they buy, but I want them to be proud of it. Yep. So if for them pride comes from a house on a full block of land, then so be it. That's when we'll go into the regions. Typically, though, it's for cash flow. It's because I've sat down with them and said, okay, we know your borrowing capacity. We know how much you're happy to spend. How much are you happy for this to cost you per month? What's your upper limit? And if someone says to me less than $500 per month is what I'm willing to put in as shortfall, I'm probably taking them to the regions. Yep. So that's usually what um, precipitates that decision to go to the regions. And in terms of who I deal with, I've worked with as, as young as 22. I had a 22-year-old save his money and buy a beautiful house on 800 square metres of land in a, in a, a suburb called Eureka. I've had um, first-time investors, couples, families, who have decided that um, maybe one party uh, you know, the husband is excited, the wife's a bit nervous or vice versa. Um, one party's a bit anxious at the idea of spending, you know, a million dollars or $800,000. So for them, it's a dunking the toe in the water, but it's also a chance to get familiar and confident. And once you've got confidence and once your partner's on board, then it opens up um, those emotional blockers and you can start investing in, in capital growth assets as well. But I've also had, I've helped... Um, someone who wants to do a three-site subdivision and he had fantastic plan, good um, feasibility um, assistance at his fingertips and, you know, in the shape of a very responsive town planner and designer. Um, I've also worked with investors that have, have gone into higher price points and targeted a really beautiful part of the city, knowing that they could have gone into Melbourne and maybe been, you know, in the middle or out of ring, but they've decided being right in Soldiers Hill or Ballarat Central or, Geelong City or Newtown, they're banking on getting a better capital growth result in those amazing blue chip areas in the yeah. region. 
than what they would be getting in the gentrifying parts of Melbourne. So there's a lot of conversation around the numbers as well because sometimes that is a reason for me to, to take someone into an amazing part of a region. It's because they do want capital growth and I feel that with the budget that they're willing to spend in the region, they will potentially get better capital growth there than what their budget would get them. It's a little bit more limited. You know, if you're working with a $600,000 budget, you're wanting capital growth in Melbourne, it's a little bit harder. Mm. And I've, I've helped someone buy um, a, a refitted out old pub in Soldiers Hill. So it's this beautiful old hotel with an, an amazing history and it's a gorgeous townhouse now. So, yeah, it comes wow. in all shapes and sizes. Yeah. Well, there you go. Um, everyone, If know your cash flows, know what kind of property you want if you're looking for capital growth, um, rental income. Kate, thank you so much for your time today. It's been tremendously insightful for me and as well as everyone out there that's listening. Um, for everyone out there, um, that's just a little bit on investing into regional properties. Obviously, the case for investing into property differs depending on who you are. Uh, if you've got any questions, look, feel free to reach out to me, um, investortypes at gmail.com or hit me up on uh, LinkedIn on Facebook. You can find me, Stefan Angelini. Even if you want an introduction to Kate, reach out to me and I'll put you guys in touch if you feel that's, that's suitable for Kate. Thank you so much for your time. Are there any parting words oh, you want to leave everyone with? Yeah, come on over to the bridge. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> See what's beyond. You know, we've got some beautiful regions and they're not just all on the western side of town, but yeah, it's definitely worth exploring. And if just spending a weekend away in a region is enough for you to, you know, whet your appetite and, and think about the virtues of it, obviously you've got to have good reason, you know, good fundamental reason to do it. But um, yeah, the regions offer a lot. Amazing. Amazing. All right. Thanks again, Kate. Thank you everyone for listening. Um, reach out if you've got any questions and we'll see you soon.